Let's do it. Main man. Main man. Main man. Main man. Main man. All the people that were working for Main Man were unusual. We were loud, ugly Americans, basically. Main Man, an interesting story, a very entertaining story, a very long, wonderful adventure. Hello and welcome to episode 61 in our series exploring the history of Main Man, the management rights company which was renowned in the 70s for completely transforming the business of rock and roll. Main Man's founder, Tony DeFries, believed that the best way for his artists to achieve their peak performances was to allow them full creative freedom, and to do that, he provided the necessary financial support they needed to fulfill their artistic vision. In support of his acts, Tony brought together a team that pioneered outrageous and often controversial promotions and marketing techniques to generate media attention that set the benchmark for the decadence and indulgences that are now part of 1970s rock folklore. This is Cherry Vanilla at the RCA Studios in New York, and today I have the honor to interview David Bowie. <laughs> Hi, David. Say hello, David. Yeah. Hello, David. Some people feel you are, by saying you're bisexual and by kind of flaunting that in a way that uh, you're trying to... Who's prepare. flaunting that? Uh, well, I mean, you say it in interviews. You, you The only people that ever bring it up are people who are interviewing me. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you're very masculine to me. Well, I am a stud. <laughs> Tony and Main Man worked with a diverse range of clients that included Amanda Lear, Mick Ronson, John Mellencamp, Mott the Hoople, Dana Gillespie, Mick Ralphs, Lou Reed, Marianne Faithful, David Bowie, and Iggy Pop. I came in with a with a musical vision that that was already in progress when I got here, and uh, it became refined and defined by my reactions to British culture in general, a world stage macrocosmically, and then specifically the first stirrings of glam and uh, really a neo-invasion that was being formed here. And the biggest positive influence on us here were, were really the Mark Bolan records that were being made at the time. Those were, those were fine records. And the first Led Zeppelin record. In this episode, we're beginning to examine the Aladdin Sane era Bowie. The album was written and recorded during the Ziggy Stardust tours of the UK and the US in late 72 and early 73. Several of the tracks were heavily influenced by Bowie's perceptions of America, with lyrics inspired by his growing profile, his experiences on the road, the usual sex, drugs and rock and roll, and also his ongoing fascination with death and, as the title suggests, his underlying paranoia about the very fine line between mental stability and insanity. That was brought about mostly by his personal family experiences, particularly those of his half-brother, Terry Burns, who struggled with mental health issues throughout his life. Bowie credited Terry with introducing him to things like modern jazz, Buddhism and beat poetry, some of the most essential artistic touch points that influenced Bowie's career. But Terry's mental health struggles would become an ever-present theme within Bowie's work for the rest of his life. David was very aware of the pressure to follow the critical acclaim of the Ziggy Stardust album with a creative progression, he stated several times in 1972 while preparing material for a new album that anything he created would be perceived as Ziggy Part 2. As a result of the different directions that Bowie was being pulled in at the time, under pressure to write and record while on the road, he found time to experiment with different rhythms and ideas that would manifest themselves fully once he abandoned this glam period in a few years' time. Before we hear from Tony DeFries with his personal perspective on the creation of Aladdin Sane and the songs that David wrote for the album, Here's David recorded in 2001, describing how he viewed his approach to songwriting. Searching for music is like searching for God. They're very similar. There's an effort to reclaim the unmentionable, the unsayable, the unseeable, the unspeakable, all those things comes into being a composer, into writing music, searching for notes and pieces of musical information that don't exist, taking away all the theatrics or the costuming and all the outer layers of what it is. I'm a writer, is what I do. I write. And I started examining the subject matter that I write about. And it really only boils down to a few songs based around loneliness to a certain extent, coupled with isolation, some kind of spiritual search, and a looking for a way into communicating with other people. And I dress it different ways throughout my life. With those recollections from Bowie as a backdrop, 
Here's Tony DeFries explaining how David's personal experiences shaped Aladdin Zane. Love is not loving. This is a theme that David often went back to in different songs, different recordings. We can look at The Prettiest Star, an early version, and even earlier than that, Letter to Hermione, Janine, Wild Eye Boy from Free Cloud, and Signet Committee, all on very early... In fact, that, all those songs were on one album, which we later released as Space Oddity, along with Space Oddity. And there's the thing that drives David's songwriting for a very long time, and especially in all these early years. The evident candidates on A Len Insane will get to later, but what's interesting is that the period in which Aladdin Hussain was written was probably the beginning of David becoming a very successful and ultimately very famous rock star. Something he always wanted and was never able to achieve. Something his father, John Jones, had tried and failed to do before he married Peggy, his mother Margaret. John Jones inherited some money when he was 21. Quite a lot of money for the time, £2,000, but you're talking about the 1900s here, so that was a good deal of money then. And lost it all trying to promote a singer. The singer was called Hilda Sullivan, and she failed. And notwithstanding that, and maybe because of that, he married her and he was still married to her when he met Peggy. That was quite a lot later, but when he met Peggy, they became romantically engaged, entangled, however you want to call it. (laughs) But the ultimate result of meeting Peggy was John Jones and Peggy Burns, as she was then, had a love child, and the love child was... David Robert Jones, and he was born, of course, on January the 8th, as we all know, the Presley date, and that was in 1947. Peggy had already had a number of lovers in her life. She'd grown up wanting to be the sort of glamorous, exciting heroine that she read about in Jane Austen novels and failed to achieve that, but did have a lot of lovers, the first of whom deserted her, a French uh, Jewish boy from Paris, Rosenberg, ran away and left her to have the baby, and that was Terence Burns. And Terence, later called Terry, but actually Terence, was, of course, David's older half-brother. And again... What David looked for from Terry and got for a while was that same unconditional love. But when Terry descended into schizophrenia and followed many of his mother's family who equally had outbursts and episodes of schizophrenia, that love that Terry and David shared when they were still young ceased to be the love that David was looking for. And so he went on looking for it. He thought he'd found it with Angela. David wasn't very successful with love affairs. He was quite successful at getting girls. He was quite successful in that this is as he gets older into his teens and we start hitting the 60s when sex became much more available. He is very good at attracting girls and girls often are willing to sleep with him. But what they don't do is give him that absolute positive and always unconditional affection that he wants. Possibly the only girl who does that is Dana Gillespie, who he meets in one of his multiple band failures. I think it was the Manish Boys again at the Marquee Club, which pops up later on in the story. (laughs) 
But Dana is in many ways quite unique for the time. Not entirely though, but she's one of that breed of 60s girls who does everything on her own terms. She's not looking for a husband. She's not looking for even a boyfriend in the sense of somebody who's going to be her protector. Dana's absolutely sure that she can protect herself. She used to carry a knife in her boot just in case. She's completely confident of her own abilities. She's very, very beautiful when she's a teenager. She meets David when she's 14. We're not supposed to talk about that, but that's what it is. <laughs> and she's already been engaged in a friendship with Dylan. She's not looking to be anybody's wife. She is willing to be an equal to whoever she's with. She has lots of boyfriends, including me later on, when I meet her. But she doesn't want to be anybody's missus, and she never becomes anybody's missus. She does, however, have a marvellous life with enormous amounts of romantic involvement and lots of what she happily describes as horizontal encounters, often long, often frequent. David was one of those, and they remained friends for a long time. But they were only briefly romantically involved. Now, Angela. Angela comes along and she's a strange mixture of an American girl who's also from Cyprus. And being from Cyprus in America is unusual, it's interesting. She's ambitious, she's smart, she looks a little bit like David. She's androgynous and skinny. But David is attracted to that because almost like looking in the mirror and seeing himself, as far as Andrew is concerned, she's very determined to become famous. She thinks that she could be an actress, but she doesn't really work at developing any kind of talent and she has no innate capability to perform. What she's good at is organisation and... She has a certain flair for style, an eye for colour and clothes and decoration, and she's really good at shopping. All this becomes useful for David going forward, but Angela can't remain, once she's met David, she can't remain in England for more than a few months at a time. She's operating on a visa that doesn't permit her to stay. And this is not a time when it's easy for girls to find meaningful work and she doesn't want to find temporary work as a telephone operator or a typist which is not, doesn't line up with her ambitions. So she sees David as a possible ticket to staying in England and being able to enter the sum level of the entertainment business or the film business or the show business. Unfortunately, David's not sufficiently interested to propose marriage. So Angela comes and goes back and forth to Cyprus and quite quickly decides to suggest to David that she's possibly pregnant, which isn't true, but which she thinks will be enough of a ploy to get him more interested and then off she goes to Cyprus. David doesn't like being left on his own. He's not good at being on his own. When he was growing up he had family and although his parents were different and didn't have the same aims and had their own conflicts, they were still there for him. That ceased to be the case of course when his father died in 1969 so then they weren't there for him anymore and Peggy wasn't able to manage a grown up David and he was left on his own and then he had a series of girlfriends who each one ultimately failed to be what he was looking for and so when Angela came along he was 
open to the idea of somebody new who would be that ultimate love interest that he was looking for, that he wanted, that he was trying to put into his life. Now David's idea of unconditional love was that he would be free to do whatever he wanted but would have someone who was always there so he wouldn't be alone. He tried achieving that with many of his early band members or school friends. And these were invariably boys, and whether it was Jeffrey McCormack or George Underwood or many of the others, in most cases they weren't there for him 24-7. And that meant he needed somebody who would be there 24-7. He briefly experienced that with the mime troupe that he joined, and there he found Hermione, and for a while... But then she left him. David hated being left. He hated the idea that somehow he did, wasn't able to hang on to that person, even though he was wildly promiscuous and unfaithful to a high degree to whoever he was with. But he didn't see that as something that should prevent them from being there when he needed them. Angela came back because David called her up frantically and said he doesn't want to marry his own and he misses her and will she come back and so she leaves Cyprus and comes back and says look I'm going to have to go again if you don't marry me and still at this point they both know that she's not pregnant but they both go along with the idea that maybe she is pregnant and they get married they both agree that this will be an open marriage, that they can have boyfriends on her side or his side and girlfriends on either of their sides and neither of them will try and make the other be anything but constantly loving them without having to give up the possibility of loving others. That's not something that Angela really wants. She only agrees to it because she thinks it's a way to keep David. And she thinks that eventually, if she has a baby, or if she just is around non-stop, she can fend off all the other possible contestants and make him love her. That actual plan might have worked if David hadn't become famous. The problem for Angela is... When David achieves even a glimmer of fame, he's immediately surrounded by young, pretty girls and boys, but especially the girls who, whether it's Surinda Fox, whether it's Bebe Buell, whether it's Ava Cherry, they're all enchanted by the idea of here's this well-mannered, and he's always well-mannered, polite, courteous, good in bed, and treats them as though they're special, each and every one of them, and makes them feel like they're important. So David, having had to struggle when he was a teenager and when he was going through his early efforts to become a rock star, he always had to struggle with how could he have as many girlfriends as he wanted and still have somebody waiting for him at home. That's what he grew up with. He grew up with the Peggy situation where Peggy and John treated David as their little prince. He was their, ultimately, their prettiest star. He was going to be the one that made it all happen. Unfortunately, John was never able to make it happen for David and died before David got famous. So John never got to see that his plans or ambitions or hopes for David were actually eventually realised because it was all too late. Meanwhile, Peggy became very, very unhappy and bitter because she didn't get the life she wanted and she had to deal with not only Terry being um, something that 
John Jones always resented. John Jones was constantly reminded that Terry was an indicator of how unfaithful Peggy had been to him even before they met and got married. People are very strange. It's odd to think that a man will blame a woman for having children with other men before she met him and the other men she wasn't married to. When he was married to this singer, Hilda Sullivan, who he tried to promote and failed to promote, when he met Peggy, and he had no hesitation in having a romantic and obviously sexual affair with Peggy, whilst he was still married to Hilda. So that's how David came about. And it wasn't until almost the end of the year in which David was conceived that Peggy and John got married, because before that, John was still married to Hilda. And Peggy actually was living with John and Hilda. So all this was happening in the 60s, and still this idea that somehow Terry was a stain on John's character was still something that the English middle classes believed and even the English working classes believed that it was okay for a man to effectively have an illegitimate child but it wasn't okay for a woman. That double standard was very much apparent and the result of it was that David who worshipped his older brother felt a great deal of parental conflict growing up because to love Terry, he had to essentially betray his father or his mother, or both of them. And then, of course, when Terry became so conflicted himself that he couldn't remain living with them and was institutionalised, that also was a huge loss for David. So all these losses accumulated, and then the way that David expressed them was to write these marvellous songs. So that's how I see Aladdin Sane. I see the songs as being expressions of this failure to reach out and secure the unconditional love that he was looking for. Tony DeFries with his thoughts on the factors that influenced many of the lyrics on Aladdin Sane. In the next episode, Tony begins breaking the album down track by track, explaining where and how each track was written and recorded. There are some great pieces of memorabilia from the Ziggy and Aladdin Sane eras on the Main Man Label website, along with a huge collection of other historic documents, including articles, telexes, letters, and production notes, many of them never seen before, that we're adding to the Main Man Label website each week. It's a great record of a very exciting period in rock history. That's at mainmanlabel.com. And on the website, you can also check out the other episodes in the Main Man series. I'm Des Shaw, and this is a Zinc Media MM Tech production. Thanks for listening.